Good morning. I'm so glad you've joined us. We've gathered to connect to the source of all love and life, and we need this. We are blessed, and we are making our journey with Jesus to the cross and to the resurrection. Thank you for joining us. I would remind you that the simplest way you have to offer an invitation to join the circle of our love is to click on share if you're on Facebook and let others know that you're watching this live. We began our worship with the tradition of lighting our Christ candle. If you have one, I invite you to do the same. And as we do, we remind ourselves that we're setting aside this time very intentionally as a time to connect to God and to one another, that this is a sacred holy time that we need to enter into this for the sake of our souls. Thank you for being here. Will you join me now in our call to worship? We gather together as the people of God to do the work of God. We gather here as a people of love and hope to be for the world the grace of Christ. Let it be so. Amen. Our opening hymn is two verses from How Firm a Foundation, verses 1 and 4. It is good news that brings us here. Whatever the powers of darkness and death that have held you in bondage this week, we have gathered in the name of Jesus, and he is the one who can set us free. The powers of darkness are overthrown by Jesus and his great love. Your sins are forgiven. You are the beloved child of God. A place is prepared for you at the table. You are precious. You can let go of the weight and let yourself experience the wonder that is God's kingdom breaking into this moment. And the peace of Christ that descends into our hearts, bringing down the walls that separate us from one another, from God, from our truest self. The peace of Christ be with you and also, also with you. you. And now it is our time for ch the children, and I'm going to get from Terry the clicker. Thank you, Terry. <clears throat> hey. You know how I know that Jesus really loves you guys. Well, it's a lot of the reasons, but one of the reasons is because of a story from the Bible that comes from the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. 
it tells of a time when Jesus was with his disciples traveling. He had 12 of them. Hey, Matthew and Tommy, I really enjoyed seeing you guys when I went for my walk this week and you were in the front yard playing with your parents. That was really cool. (laughs) Anyway, Matthew, tell us what happened. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. The disciples spoke sternly to them. That means they, they said to those children, don't come near Jesus. He's too important for you. He's too important for little children. He can't waste his time on you children. Go away, kids. Scram. Michael, do you think that was right? No. You're right, Michael. It was not right. How about you, Ryan? No. That's right. No, it was not. Ryan. I also saw you, Ryan, this week riding your scooter on your driveway. It was pretty cool. So, Matthew and Roma, tell us what happened next. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Did you hear that? God's kingdom belongs to children. Because God's kingdom is like a great party where everybody is loved and welcomed and having a great time together. It's a fun place. In fact, whenever, we, whenever we're filled with fun and love, we're in the kingdom of God. And you guys know how to have fun, right? Yes! That's right, Nikki, Abby, and Maddie. You know how to have fun. And you know what else Jesus said? Tell us, Roma. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. Did you hear that? You guys have to help us grown-ups learn how to enter the kingdom of God, which means you have to remind us to play, to laugh, to dance, because God's kingdom is a place of joy. Isn't that right, Ryan? Yes! So, Matthew, tell us how this little Bible story ends. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. That's right. Jesus took these little children up into his arms, and he blessed them. So you guys have really good imaginations. Generally, you have better imaginations than we adults do, grown-ups. So here's another little suggestion. You remember about the prayer chair? Did you pick one out in your house? You can still do it if you haven't. So if you're feeling a little sad or maybe mad or afraid or whatever, try this. Go sit in your prayer chair, close your eyes, And then use your imagination to pretend that you're sitting on Jesus' lap. And try to imagine Jesus telling you just how much he loves you, how he takes special delight in you, and he's always looking over you. I think this may be, have been the very first song I ever learned in Sunday school. Will you sing it with me? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. 
Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus' love is so big, so wide, and that's the reason at the end of our time together, what is it, Austin, that we always say? There's always room in the circle, I miss you. And I miss you too, Austin. There's always room in the circle. And we are to turn and become like little Michael here. So, now we're going to be blessed by an anthem sung to the glory of God by our own David Kemsley. question was raised as my conscience fell, a simple little lie. It didn't mean much, but it lingers still in the corners of my mind. Still you call me to walk on the edge of this world, to spread my dreams and fly. But the future's so far, my heart is so frail I think I'd rather stay inside But you love me anyway It's like nothing in life that I've ever known Yes, you love me anyway Oh God, how you love me how you love me It took more than my strength To simply be still To seek but never find All the reasons we change The reasons I doubt And why do loved ones have to die But you love me It's like nothing in life that I've ever known Yes, you love me anyway Oh God, how you love me I am the thorn in your crown But you love me anyway I am the sweat from your brow but you love me anyway I am the nail in your wrist But you love me anyway I am Judas's kiss But you love me anyway See now I am the man who yelled out from the crowd for your blood to be spilled on this earth-shaking ground and then I turned away with a smile on my face with this sin in my heart tried to bury your grace then alone in the night I still called out for you so ashamed of my life my life my life but you love me anyway How you love me Yes, you love me anyway It's like nothing in life That I've ever known Yes, you love me anyway Oh God How you love me Yes, you love me. 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 Yes,
Yes, you love me. Yes, you love me. How you love me. How you love me. How you love me. Thank you, David, reminding us of how Jesus loves us, loves us so. If we were in person, this would be the time when we would offer our gifts unto the Lord. I thank you for your offerings, all the ways that you support our common ministry. It's so important what we're doing together, sharing the good news of God's great love revealed in Jesus in these troubling times. I thank you for your financial gifts and your prayers and all those little ways in which you express God's love. You can send your gifts to the church through mail or you can go to PayPal at our website. I thank you. I thank you that who've gone the second mile knowing that some of us have lost our income and you with a grateful heart have offered generously to help support our work. So thank you. You know what? I need a Bible. I'll be right back. I brought my sermon, but not the Bible. Isn't that silly? Thank you. try to have everything ready and always there's something you forget. Yeah, I'm going to take off my mask, Terry. I'm going to try to find the right passage first. Got it. So we pick up the story in the Gospel of Mark in the 10th chapter, and it comes right after the story that we just heard Matthew and Roma tell about the children and Jesus. Listen, the word of the Lord. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before Jesus. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything you have and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And then, come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had many possessions. Thus ends the reading of the word. May God bless our hearing of the word. So this story is told about a little boy who receives a new little baby sister. She comes home from the hospital. And in spite of the fact that generally when a firstborn child has a sibling come into the house, well, there's some resentment. This little boy seemed altogether fascinated and attracted to his little baby sister. He began to ask his 
Parents, if he could have a little alone time with his baby sister. This struck them as a little odd and wary of the fact that, yes, sometimes firstborns feel some hostility towards these usurpers to the throne. They were a little cautious. But the child seemed sincere in his request and so persistent that finally they gave in, knowing that they could allow the little boy to be in his baby sister's bedroom while the baby monitor was on so they could listen in just in case anything sounded like it wasn't going the way it should. So at first, there was just silence as the boy gazed down into the crib, into the eyes of his baby sister. The only sound, those beautiful cooing sounds that babies make. And then finally, tell me about heaven. I'm beginning to forget. Did this story really happen? I have no idea. But it is true in the sense that it expresses the truth that we know that babies are a gift from God. And also, this intuitive sense that we have that newborn babies enter this world with a kind of wordless wisdom. If I were to try to put into words this wordless wisdom, which perhaps makes them so attractive to us, I'd say, it is their capacity to realize that life is a miracle, a great mystery that is just filled with reasons to be filled with wonder and awe. And also the sense that deep, deep down, we're all connected, we are all one. And also at that deep, deep down level, we really are in good hands. But there's another truth expressed in this little story about the little boy and the baby sister, which is a little sadder. And that is the fact that as we grow up, we lose touch with that wordless Wisdom. It begins to be more remote. But there's no helping it because we have to grow up. And growing up is good and necessary if we're going to survive in this world. And those of us who are parents and everybody else who supports us in the raising of children have been given the job to support our children as they grow up. And as I said a couple of weeks ago, establish a sense of a strong ego, which is to realize that even though on that deepest level we're all connected, there is another level that is very practical where we're all separate. And we have to take responsibility for ourselves and learn how to become self-reliant. And so it's our job as parents to teach our children the skills and qualities they'll need to, to grow up, at, and one of the most basic of which is the gift of the power of language, the mastery of words. And yet, with the gift of language, something is gained, but something is lost. For instance, you're with a little child. The child looks up into the sky and says, what's that? You say, oh, that? That's a cloud. And the child has mastered a new word, cloud. And yet, from now on, every single cloud, which each is distinct and mysterious and wonderful, gets lumped into this one word, cloud. And in a little way, the child is a little bit further from the sense of wonder that comes with each encounter of each new cloud. 
So we want to have our kids learn how to be self-reliant. And we want them to be able to have some measure of success in this world. You know, grow up, be able to hold down a job, have a career, make some money, pay taxes, you know, become an adult. That's our job as parents. And hopefully along the way, the kid learns some good manners and a moral center and becomes a good person. And I know that's why... Sometimes we bring kids to church, right, is to help with that. It's a big job raising up a child. And we do it with varied success. But with all of this in mind, I'd like to point out that in the Bible story I just read to you, the man who runs up to Jesus gives every evidence of having been the product of some very good parenting. What I mean is, he's courteous. He kneels before the famous rabbi, which is the appropriate way to show respect. When Jesus asks him whether he has kept the basic commandments that govern the relationships between people. He says yes, and I think we have no reason to doubt him. He's followed those six commandments of the ten that are about human relationships. And towards the end, we hear that he has many possessions, which which suggests that he had a fair amount of success in his life, that he was able to earn more money than most people. He was, in short, a son for parents to be proud of. And yet, and yet, there is a desperation expressed in the fact that he runs to Jesus. There is this clear sense that he is conscious that in spite of having grown up to be a competent adult, he's missing something precious, something perhaps akin to what I was referring to in that wordless wisdom of the newborn baby. We hear that Jesus looked at the man and that he loved him. And what that means is that Jesus looked deeply into the man's heart lovingly and diagnosed what was the spiritual sickness that was afflicting him. And then he prescribed something that the man could do if he wanted to find that elusive thing he was missing. He says... You lack one thing. Go, sell all your possessions and give all the money to the poor. And then you'll have treasure in heaven. And then, come, follow me. For most of us, myself included, these words of Jesus uh, make me a little anxious. You know, uh, kind of attached to my possessions, my money. If it's any comfort, this is the one and only instance where Jesus makes this request of an individual to go and sell all he has and give it all away, which would imply that this isn't a requirement if you're going to follow Jesus, though I think we can say that having a concern for the plight of the poor is a requirement. But nonetheless, Jesus has a lot to say in the Bible about the dangers, the spiritual dangers of wealth. Money for us is our safety net. And if you're like me, you get anxious when you think maybe that safety net won't really be there 
for you fully in the future. It's the thing we put our trust in. And so I would just suggest that in those times when we're aware of anxiety arising within us about money, have it be for us a call to prayer, a call to turn back to God and remind ourselves where our trust can really be placed, which is in God. But there is more going on in this story, I think, than a warning about the dangers of money. I think that Jesus is trying to lead this man into an experience of the kingdom of God, which is another phrase that's kind of inadequate, like the phrase the man used, eternal life, to express that thing he's missing, that wordless wisdom. I led with that little story about the little boy and the baby sister because I think there is a direct connection between what Jesus saw when he looked deeply into the heart of this man And what Jesus had just said before we got to this story in that interaction with his disciples and the little children, he said, the kingdom of God belongs to children. And unless you enter the kingdom of God like a child, you will never enter it. Now, The kingdom of God is something that the parables of Jesus tells us is already breaking into this world, that it's it's there, hidden, but if we have eyes to see, we can see it. And he talked about little very ordinary things like a sower casting seeds and seeds planted in the earth. He said, if you have eyes to see it, you will be able to see it. So... Jesus is talking about the way that children receive the kingdom in relationship to the question of how we perceive life. And if we were to ask, how does this man perceive life? Well, I think we have a clue in the question that he addresses to Jesus in expressing his longing. He says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life. In the man's notion, this elusive thing he's missing is something, if he just was told how to do it right, he could attain it, that that the kingdom of God, eternal life, is is something we do. Do. It's, it's a kind of achieve, an achievement. And he's an adult afterwards, and he's good at doing stuff and achieving stuff. But the kingdom of God is not an achievement. It's not something we do. The, key, the kingdom of God, before it is anything else, is a gift. And children are a whole lot better at receiving gifts, if truth be told, than we adults are. You give an unexpected gift to a child, and they will be simply delighted. You give an unexpected gift to an adult, and well, there may be a little sense of anxiety and guilt in there, like, the questions start to roll around in our head. Uh, What did I do to deserve this gift? And uh, how can I pay this person back for this gift? It makes us feel a little out of control, and we don't like to be out of control. And so I think that when Jesus was inviting this man to let go of his safety net, he was inviting him to go out into this space where he could have an experience 
of the kingdom of God, that he could turn and become like a little child. I think it was similar to what Jesus did when he, earlier in the gospel, sends out his disciples two by two into the world without any security blankets, any safety nets, without food or money or weapons, so that they will have to learn, like a child, to trust. To trust. And to be comfortable with the gift of hospitality they will be offered in some homes. And also to trust that they themselves are a gift for those who will host them. Jesus was inviting his disciples, I think, to turn and become like a little child. The journey of following Jesus is a little bit like learning to ride a bike. It's a matter of balance. You know, it's, it's learning to become like a child without losing the good qualities of an adult. In other words, it's not licensed to be a self-centered brat, which is another manifestation at times of little children. Now, we're called to be responsible, not a slouch, to do what we can to help make the world a better place and to care for the poor. And yet, simultaneously, we're called to embrace the opportunities, and there are many that come to us to see life with the eyes of a child. The other morning, I was being a good adult. I was working hard on my sermon. Three whole hours staring at my computer, typing away. My eyes started to get a little blurry. And it occurred to me I should take a break and go do another adult thing. Go outside and pick up the dog poop on the lawn. I went outside, and lo and behold, it was an incredible, beautiful spring day, and I had not even been aware of that fact. I was awestruck. I did my job, but I found myself slowing down, slowing down, and realizing, wow, it's so beautiful out here. And I didn't even know it. And I began to let go of that compulsive need I seem to have to try to justify my existence by all I have done and achieved. And I began to let the gift of the present moment enter my heart. I began to slow down and let go of my list. And I experienced something of the kingdom of God. It's there if you have eyes to see it. Will you pray with me? Help us, O oh God, to turn and become like little children. To trust that deep, deep down we are in good hands. That we are connected to life, to other people. That life itself is a precious gift full of wonder and occasion for awe. Help us to find that balancing act of being responsible and yet being able to turn and play and dance with Jesus in his wondrous kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our hymn is one that lots of us delight in. I usually have it when we're baptizing a baby. I thought this was a good occasion to sing this song. I was there to hear your morning cry. We will sing the first three verses.
And so it is our time to pray together. It's so important to pray together. There will be opportunity for you to share by way of text, your joys and your concerns, and we invite you to do so. I remind you there's a 20 second lag between what's happening here in the sanctuary and what you're experiencing at home. So keep that in mind as you text. But would you join me now as we would turn and become like little children and open our hearts and our minds to the loving presence of God in our midst. Let us pray. Truly, O oh God, our lives are a gift given to us from you out of love. You formed us in our mother's womb. You breathed into us the breath of life. And you have blessed us in more ways than we can ever number. And although we have traveled a long ways since our birth, and we have struggled and suffered in many ways, you have always been there, waiting at that deep center for us to come home, to return to your love, to awaken once more to awe and wonder at the miracle and mystery of life. And as we enter into the stillness here together, Gratitude arises within us. We are blessed. We thank you for the signs of the coming of spring after a rough February. We thank you for those occasions to be outside in the midst of the beauty of nature. We thank you for those people who have loved us, those way back who loved us when we were little children, and those who love us now, those who have supported us and forgiven us and challenged us, those who have held faith for us when we couldn't reach that place where our faith was buried those who have done little acts of kindness that gave us hope, those who have helped us feel that connection deep, deep down. And we thank you, O oh Lord, for those people you have given us that we might love and be channels of your love and light too. For that is what you have called us to be as your followers. Channels of your grace, your healing, your peace, your forgiveness. We thank you for those moments of laughter when we were able to be like children together. And we thank you also for those times of tears shared and the catharsis, the opening up of our hardened hearts. We thank you for the gift of our church and for the gospel that you have revealed to us in Jesus of a love that is too large for us to fully grasp. And for this journey in which we move more deeply into the width and height and depth of this love. We thank you for all those in the society at large who have acted in ways that are courageous and kind in challenging times, 
calling forth the best in all of us. We thank you for those who've gone before us into your eternal kingdom and for their love that has not died. Lord, in your goodness, hear our prayers. Amy Deeks is thankful for her family and friends on earth and in heaven. She says in the movie, A Walk to Remember, she says, you can't see love, you feel it. It is like the wind. You feel it, but you can't see it. So I feel the love for my loved ones in heaven and God. I am thankful for the wind. Essay is thankful for the church's prayers for them. <clears throat> Greg and Susan want to thank everyone for their prayers for Susan's sister, Helen. Her pain and frustration is over, and we know that she is safe in the arms of the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. Barbara Simmons is thankful for being able to come back to this church again. Tim Tyler is thankful for a clean bill of health from the oncologist this week and prays that now he can get his arthritis back under control. Kayla Christofferson is blessed by getting job interviews and praying that all goes well. Mady shares, praise God, we made it through attorney review for our old house and are one step closer to selling. Prayers that the inspections will go well this Tuesday and that they find nothing big to repair. S.A. shares that she is also thankful for Pastor Jeff, his grateful and generous heart towards her son, Joe. It means a whole world to them. God bless, God bless you and your family, Jeff. We love you. Thank you, O oh God, for these gifts and so, so many others. You know us inside and out. You know us better than we know ourselves. You know the ways which we're stuck, broken, blocked. You know the ways we need to be healed, forgiven. You know the temptations of darkness that we struggle with. In this moment of stillness, we would invite your Holy Spirit to descend into the hearts and minds of each one of us, wherever we are, to meet us in that place of our deepest need, that place perhaps that keeps us awake at night. Come. Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for you are the one who delivers us from the powers of death. You are the one who sets us free to love and to be channels of your grace. You call us to pray. Invite us to trust that your spirit, like the wind, moves through our prayers. There are many persons and situations on our hearts that we seek your loving presence for. We pray for Amy Grip's dad, who just last week was diagnosed with stage four liver cancer. We pray for the whole family, for, for Amy's dad and Amy's mom and the whole family who adores this gentle and loving man, and ask that you would bless him and their time together in what would appear to be the, his last stretch of time on this earth. We pray for Claudia Bartex, teenage daughter Sydney, and are grateful for the progress that she has made after 
experiencing a, a stroke, which seems to have been related to COVID. She's we're grateful for the progress that she's made. She's now in a hosp children's hospital in New Brunswick and is hopeful to be discharged this week. Bless her and her whole family. We pray for Charlie Kensley, who's moved to Troy Hill Center as he continues to heal after his heart procedure. We pray for Anna Crystal, who had a slight stroke this week and is in the hospital, and also for Penny's Aunt Marion, also recovering from a stroke and is in rehab, and also for Sarah and Kathy's cousin Byron in Ohio, who is also in rehab, recovering from a stroke. Bless them all, O oh Lord. Be with Ben Weintraub as he recovers from back surgery and carries many responsibilities. Bless his family. We pray for Anna and Barb's friend Claire, who grieves for her husband Norman, who we've been praying for. We pray for Alex and for Betsy and June and Wes and Lynn Bostwick and Wa and Hetal, Ann Saunders, Amina and Cheryl and Cheryl's sister Susan and Angela who needs heart surgery but may not be a candidate for it. For Jim and Barbara Simmons, the Wentz family, for Heather Bryant and the child within her womb. We pray for Mary Keller's friend Bernie in the hospital with injured feet and an infection. We pray for others dealing with cancer, grateful for Betty and Tim, who have come on the far side of their initial diagnosis of early stage cancer. We thank you, we ask your your healing blessing to be upon Jean Monticulo's dear friend Ellie and Pauline's friend Ron and Arlene's Uncle John and Tim's Uncle Bill and Dave's birth mother, Darlis. And for John Halfton, who seems to have had a reoccurrence of his cancer. For Anna's sister-in-law, Norma. For my friend Dave Roundsville for Renee's husband, Bob, and Barbara Christofferson's father-in-law, and Len Chris's friend, Chris. We pray for all of them and their healing journeys. We pray for all those whose hearts are broken and grieving, and in some sense, we all grieve together. We pray for the family of Carol Payne, who after her third battle with breast cancer, went to be with you, O oh Lord. We pray for Chris and Nancy and Diana and Linda. And we pray for Susan Elbin with the death of her sister, Helen, after her long struggle with dementia. For Tim Tyler's co-worker, Tara, as her father died suddenly far off in Hawaii, for Charles Fallon and Lynn Ager and Gina and Nick and the Weiss family and Connie, Jonathan and Michael and Garrett's sister, Andrea. We pray for those who in the late in life are dealing with the frailty of their bodies, for Doris and Fred Lori Wilkins' mom and Carolyn's dad with early onset dementia, Tom's mother, Betsy O'Grady's dad, Paul Adams' parents, Dominic's mother, Greg's mom, Renee's mom, for Lincoln, for Eric Cristiango's mom, for my father and stepmother. We pray for all those who are yet dealing with COVID and its after effects, including my brother-in-law, Bobby, in Michigan, on dialysis. We 
pray for the medical staff who continue to so heroically serve on the front lines. We pray for those involved in the delivery of the vaccines. We pray for all with weakened immune systems and pray for a mindfulness in all of us for our impact on one another physically and spiritually. We pray for students of all ages seeking to learn in challenging circumstances and for teachers and parents. We pray for children with disabilities and attention deficits for whom this has been a particular challenge. We pray for those who live in institutions that are particularly at risk. We pray for Michael Crissa and Tommy Bramley, Edward Kogan and TJ Kogan, for Paul's brother Doug, for Carolyn's sister Beverly, Amy Deke's mother, Dawn's dad, Anna's mother Muriel, and June Snetcher's mom, and Diane Morgan. We pray for all who are in the valley of the shadow, they might, that they might feel your love, your light, leading them safely home. We pray for families under stress, in need of healing. We pray for those struggling with loneliness, for those dealing with addictions that have been ag- aggravated in this time. We pray for all who deal with depression and other psychiatric illnesses. For those who are searching for jobs. For those who've lost businesses. We pray for reconciliation in our divided nation and the capacity to listen and love in spite of seeing the world differently. We pray for the capacity to honor the sacred worth of every single human being. We pray for our damaged earth, for the web of life, for those who are yet recovering from the storms. We pray for your little ones, O Lord, throughout the world, refugees, the homeless, the orphans. We pray for the places where violence has afflicted such death and suffering. And we pray for the capacity to turn away from violence in all its forms. We pray for courage, for faith. We pray for blessings of persons in authority. And in some sense, we all Have our places where we exercise power, O Lord. Help us to exercise it with humility and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Dave Kinsley has prayers for his co-worker, Alicia, whose parents have COVID, and her grandmother, who has several health issues. I asked for prayers for my friend, Greg, who passed out this week and fell and pushed his front teeth back. And he's going to the dentist tomorrow to have his teeth wired together to hopefully solve any problems and keep them intact. Joanne asked for continued prayers for her cousin Kit in Paris as she is still undiagnosed with some sort of infection. She's going to undergo more testing. Tim Tyler asked prayers that his client Barbara can successfully complete attorney review and move to her new home and restart her life after the loss of her husband to COVID. Paul Adams asked prayers for Betsy as she will be having injections in her back tomorrow, prayers that this will bring pain relief. Amy Deeks asked prayers that she find a permanent full-time good job. Carolyn asked prayers for her friend Sheila, who had a teacher at her school take her own life this past week, and prayers for her friend, whose mother passed away the same week due to COVID. 
Dean asked prayers for those suffering from COVID, especially the long haulers. Michelle Chafee asked prayers for her childhood friend, Jason, who died suddenly this week at the age of 39. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we entrust all these people, all these needs. Remind us that you are at work in this world in ways beyond our understanding to bring healing and hope and reconciliation, that your kingdom is present among us if we but open our eyes to see its appearance among us in the midst of all that is uncertain and difficult. We thank you for our calling to be disciples. For you have given us authority under the, over the unclean spirits, which is to say we have power, O oh Lord, given to us from you to be healers and offer, offer hope and love in this broken world in ways that set people free from all that oppresses, all that diminishes in destroys life. And so we would take up our cross and follow. And we would pray the words that Jesus himself taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And our final singing will be the last three verses of that hymn we sang before. I was there to hear your morning cry. you've joined us today it makes a difference it makes a difference for us to make this connection and turn our hearts towards God opening ourselves up to God's spirit and listening for the call to Jesus from Jesus together before the final benediction we pause for announcements can't have coffee hour in person but we can meet on zoom a zoom meeting will be convened shortly after the benediction you're welcome to join us with your own coffee and there are opportunities to connect over zoom in the course of the week monday and tuesday at noon hosted by joanne and fridays with betsy and on Wednesday and Thursday, I offer at noon a guided meditation time that is helpful if you're feeling particularly stressed or you're seeking healing in your life. I invite you to join us Wednesday and Thursdays on Zoom. I have a Bible study that I'm teaching in depth of the Gospel of Mark, digging deep into it. And uh, it will continue through Holy Week, and you're welcome to hop on board. We're coming down the home stretch now. 
There is good news, particularly for those of you who have particularly longed to be back in the space of our sanctuary that is so precious to us and to see one another's eyes again. The Administrative Council voted this past week to begin letting people back into the sanctuary for worship on Palm Sunday. That's two weeks from today. There are, however, significant things to keep in mind. You will be required to wear a mask and to practice social distancing throughout your time here. We're going to keep it at a limit to 50 people in attendance. There will be a sign up sheet sent to you in email and other manners in the week before. If you know you're gonna come, sign up because we're not going to be able to allow beyond 50. There won't be any Sunday school. We'd love to have the children with us, but you need to know they'll just sit with their parents through the service, but we miss seeing them so. And there won't be any coffee hour. Live stream worship, this is important, is going to continue. In fact, it's going to get better <laughs> because that fancy new camera that we raise money for well, it's almost installed. And what that means is it's going to create a better quality of picture and the stuff you can't see right now, all these lighting stuff that's cluttering up the altar, it's all going to get removed. And so live stream worship is going to continue from here on in so you can feel good and fine about choosing to stay home rather than to come to be in this space. You can connect with us fully uh, on, online, and I hope you will choose that. If you uh, have some kind of uh, threat to your immune system and haven't received your double vaccination, or if you're having any kind of symptoms of illness at all, we ask that you not come to worship at this point. Um, There'll be more information coming to you later, but we wanted to give you a heads up. And uh, this is exciting, I know, for some of us who've just ached to be back in this space. Next, once again, there are people quite willing to help if you need somebody to shop for you or run errands for you, let us know. And if you're having challenge just putting food on your table. There's food offered by the town every Friday morning. You just have to show up at uh, the parking lot of the Liquid Church. There's opportunities to volunteer for that. And I also have been given from many of you offerings to my discretionary fund. I have this available to you in your, if you are in a time of need. And once again, I thank you for your ongoing support of our ministry together. It is so important what we share together. So thank you. The benediction. Jesus calls you to follow him and to turn and become like a child and to witness God's beloved kingdom breaking into this broken world to offer signs of hope, laughter, and tears that bring healing, to be an agent of reconciliation, to shine light where there is darkness, to keep the faith and hold it for others. Go forth into this world empowered by the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen.